All right, so a quick post about the danger airway hazard ahead. Now, we're all used to talking about the difficult airway. There's tons of uh, literature on this subject matter, a lot of opinions, uh, a lot of tweeting, and, and the attention's appropriate. And uh, what we have to remember, though, is what we're doing when we're assessing the difficult airway. We're looking at what are the patient issues that we need to pay attention to that are going to influence our decision-making how to approach an airway. And most commonly, your decision making is around, is it appropriate to do an awake approach based on difficulty, usually anatomic or pathologic difficulty, versus is it safe to, uh, to do an RSI? Other factors come in to uh, the decision making beyond anatomy and, and pathology. The most common is in emergency medicine is cooperation. So um, an algorithm might direct this uh, to the awake approach, but often we can't do that because of uh, patient agitation cooperation. Now, it's been my my uh, uh, premise and my experience is that we overcall overcall this inability of the patient to cooperate, and and often they will be cooperative enough, or we can render them cooperative uh, um, with uh, with an approach. And the, the other factor that's uh, that's been, we've had a, a lot more attention to appropriately is the patient's physiology. So assessment is not only look at them from a, are they going to be tough to tube? If I can't tube them, am I going to be able to bag them? If I can't bag them, am I going to be able to rescue them with either a supraglottic airway, ultimately an emergency front of neck airway? Uh, Physiolog physiology, it doesn't, it's not just looking up at the monitor and looking at their, their map, their blood pressure, their heart rate, um, figuring out what their shock index is, is the, the assessment should involve more than that. And that, that might include, and what I'm starting to do and many are advocating for, is, is POCUS, so ultrasounding that patient. And again, you'll get more information. It's not a be-all and end-all, but used with a Bayesian approach. In other words, you have a clinical uh, opinion and thoughts on this case, and it gives you more information in terms of you know, their ability to tolerate fluid or um, their, uh, what, their, what the status is in terms of myocardial function or if they've got some other abnormality that uh, should be addressed before you manage the patient's airway. And that is the principle, is that we resuscitate before we intubate. And the, the term that Rich Levitin has coined, you know, resuscitation sequence intubation as opposed to it being rapid sequence intubation. So they don't rush in putting a tube in and they don't get better from plastic. And take care of the patient's physiology, correct it um, as best you can, and, uh, and then proceed uh, with the most appropriate uh, way to go, whatever that might be, um, based on your assessment. Um, for from an airway perspective. So that's the difficult airway. You spend a lot of time on this and it's very, very appropriate to do so. And I think we need to be better than that. But this doesn't necessarily equate to having a good outcome. In other words, if I've addressed all of these things, you know, why do bad things still happen? And this is where we, we've introduced uh, the, the concept of the, the dangerous airway. And the dangerous airway might begin here. In other words, you haven't addressed their physiology, their shunt physiology, and you haven't pre-oxygenated them properly. And therefore, they desaturate and something happens bad as a result of that. Right? So there are patient issues, but often, again, it's, it's, uh, it's really other issues that are at play that ultimately lead to bad outcomes. So we have to assume that, that everything that happened in that first triangle, if you're managing the patient, that you've optimized your skill, you've optimized pre-oxygenation, you uh, have optimized or best effort, whatever term you want to do in performing laryngoscopy or placing a supraglottic airway or ultimately doing an ephona, and that that's what determines outcome of the patient. But we forget about the fact that there are other environmental issues that influence um, airway outcomes. And collectively, patient issues and environmental issues, I, I think it's reasonable to refer to uh, collectively as this is what defines the dangerous airway. Now, Jared Mosier, um, myself, uh, and Adam Lon, John Sackles, um, wrote a, a little 
piece in an obscure journal um, discussing this in part. But big picture is there are patient issues that we need to optimize um, and before we proceed that otherwise will create dangerous condition. And then there are other environmental issues. And those environmental issues relate to, you know, is what's the provider level of experience? You know, is, is, is this patient, is this person skilled uh, enough to manage the patient that is before them? And that's, that, that, that's an issue. And clearly, this is going to affect outcome. Uh, if they're not, do they have access to help? How far away is that help? What kind of support do they have? Do they have the right equipment? Do they know how to use that equipment? And I'm going to suggest that a lot of bad outcomes are really related to these environmental issues. It's not related to the patient's intrinsic abnormal anatomy or pathology or their physiology or their inability to cooperate. It really is around the, the, the other issues. Provider skill, um, not optimizing uh, your, your, your management before proceeding, not having the, the skills to use the, the equipment that you have available or not having the equipment available, and not calling for support um, in the, in, at, the, at the right time if you have access to it. Now, a lot of this, it's out of your control, right? You're working in a small hospital in East Nowhere. And again, you might have limited equipment. You might have limited support. And again, you might have a limited skill set. But I think you can augment that, right? There's always somebody on the phone that you can talk to, right? And say, listen, I've got this patient before me. I really don't have anybody. I, I want to run this by you. Um, this is what I'm doing so far, right? Uh, for us, where, where I work, it's calling me or us, which is our life flight, our, our, our critical care transport program. A lot of what we do is provide advice. We don't just say, hey, airway, go ahead and manage the patient. We say, listen, when's the last time you've done this? We get this information and then we make a shared decision on how to proceed um, with that particular, uh, that, ca that case. We ask, what kind of equipment? Do you have support? Is the ambulance crew that brought in, the paramedic crew that brought in the patient, are they still available? Can they help you? Is there somebody in the community that's five minutes away that, yeah, they're not on call that might come in and help you, right? So there, there's, there's ways to address the fact that you don't have the skill necessarily or you don't have the support, right? Equipment issues. You know, this is something you have to preemptively um, deal with. And again, what I'm hoping that we'll have standardized equipment across our province, right? So that you don't have to guess what equipment's going to be available. Not only we have that standard equipment available from an airway management point of view, but everybody's been in service on how to use it. There's a lot of movements to try to make this happen. And uh, it's an important point. So yes, there's the difficult airway, but the bigger picture is the, the dangerous airway and you can't address one without the other and expect good airway outcomes think about it do something about it thanks for listening